Thank you. Okay, great. <clears throat> Good morning, and welcome to the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget hearing. I am Rafael Espinal, the chair of the City Council Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. This morning, we will be reviewing the projected budget of the Department of Consumer Affairs for fiscal year 2020. Specifically, we will be assessing DCA's programs and activities to ensure that the agency is serving the public in a financially responsible way. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge uh, that we've been joined by my colleague and, and member of the committee, Peter Ku from Queens. Uh, the Mayor's Fiscal 2020 Preliminary Budget for the Department of Consumer Affairs is $43.4 million, including $29.3 million in personal services funding to support 450 budgeted full-time positions. The funds in the Fiscal 2020 Preliminary Budget are primarily allocated to resolve consumer and working complaints, issue various licenses, and educate and protect consumers and ensure that businesses comply with the local and state laws. In a few minutes, we'll hear from the administration on specific plans for these allocated funds in our discussion with DCA this morning. I hope to explore different areas of the budget to gain clarity and transparency on where and how money is being spent to protect consumers, create financial empowerment for New Yorkers, educate businesses, and maintain high standards for employee rights in New York City. In particular, I look forward to hearing more from DCA regarding the rebranding of the agency announced by the mayor in January, which will increase DCA's worker protection mandate. Secondly, I wish to discuss DCA's budget realignment within its adju adjudication unit. Lastly, I'd like to examine DCA's reporting in the PMMR to gain a better perspective on how well aligned its budget is with its performance. We will first hear from the Department of Consumer Affairs and then members will have a chance to follow up with questions for the commissioner. After that, members of the public will have an opportunity to provide testimony. I hope that the commissioner or members of her staff will stay in here put the public testimonies. I look forward to working with the agency and other interested parties to finalize the budget over the next few months. In closing, I want to, sta I want to thank my staff and the committee staff and the budget staff for working to put this hearing together. And also, I would like to acknowledge we've been joined by Bal Keys, who's been away for a few months. Thanks for coming back. It's great to have you back in the committee. Uh, we will now hear testimony from the Department of Consumer Affairs. So, Commissioner, uh, before you begin, may you and your team raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to answer uh, council member questions honestly? I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Spinal and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I'm Laurel Salas and I am the Commissioner of the Department of Consumer Affairs. I'm joined here today, this morning, by my colleagues Nick Rosa, Director of Finance, and Casey Adams, Director of City and Legislative Affairs. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today about DCA's budget for the fiscal year 2020. DCA's mission is to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create thriving communities. We do this by licensing more than 71,000 businesses across more than 50 industries and enforcing key consumer protection, licensing, and workplace laws that apply to countless more. This year is a time of celebration and reflection for DCA. 2019 marks the 50th anniversary of the agency's creation under Mayor John Lindsay in 1969. Today, I will share with you some of DCA's major successes for New Yorkers over the past year and show you where the agency plans to go to in 2019. Um, I'll begin by just briefly discussing our budget. DCA's total expense budget in the fiscal year 2020 is uh, $43.4 million an increase of about 1.4% from the fiscal year 2019 budget at adoption. Our total revenues are 
close to $30 million in an increase of about 8.7%, mainly attributable to an increase in the number of sidewalk cafe licenses and associated consent fees. Our agency authorized headcount remains the same at 450 positions. This is an exciting time for DCA. During our 50th anniversary, Mayor de Blasio announced that DCA's mission will expand as the agency is renamed the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection with a powerful mandate to defend consumers and workers. As part of this expansion, DCWP will develop a free, uniquely tailored alternative dispute resolution program to help domestic workers and employers resolve issues and provide both parties institutional support and tools for ensuring optimal employment conditions. We will also expand the groundbreaking program established under the Freelance is in Free Act, which helps ensure that freelancers are paid on time and in full for the work they've completed. Finally, DCWP will work to implement the first in the nation mandate for paid personal time for New York City workers, Mayor de Blasio proposed in his State of the City address. This expansion builds on the landmark work done by DCA's Office of Labor Policy and Standards, which enforces New York City's paid safe and sick leave law. The Fair Work Week scheduling law that guarantees fast food and retail workers the right to a predictable and stable schedule and implementation of the Freelance is in Free Act. In the fall, we, we told the committee about the important work DCA has been doing to identify the challenges impacting student loan borrowers and to better protect and promote their financial health. Building on original research, oh, I'm just gonna watch a very, very I've been very coming to the Financial video. Empowerment Center for the past year. The first time I came here, I was still paying off my student loans. Student loans is another one that's tough. I can see clients, they tend to run away from student loans and, and hope that if they hide under their covers that it's going to go away, but actually that could create a greater problem. The worst case scenario is that if you don't do anything, your wages can get garnished or they can go after your bank. It's important to come in to get a diagnosis of what is the best solution to address the student loan. I was taught on how to better manage my finances, where to allocate certain percentages or amounts to certain places depending on whatever my expenses may be, keeping in mind what my income is and how to manage my expenditures. Now that my student debts are fully paid, I want to come back to learn what else I can do to financially empower myself. Building on or original research conducted by our Office of Financial Empowerment, DCA launched student loan debt clinics to help New Yorkers understand their student loans and how to repay them. DCA's clinics provided education, student loan literacy, and opportunities for financial and legal counseling in neighborhoods that our research identified as having high levels of student loan debt-related financial distress. New Yorkers are excited about these services. More than 100 people attended appointments at our first round of student loan debt clinics, and over 300 more signed up for a waiting list. We look forward to hosting more events to meet the strong demand including our next clinic taking place at the end of this month. In addition, our financial empowerment centers continue to be a critical resource for those struggling to manage their student loans by providing free confidential one-on-one -on -one counseling with professional financial counselors who can help open a bank account, tackle debt, improve credit, and save and plan for a stable financial future. Since the creation of the Financial Empowerment Centers, OFE has conducted over 100,000 financial counseling sessions, helping over 52,000 New Yorkers improve their financial health, reduce their debt by $65 million, and increase their savings by $5.1 million. In addition, OFE has also helped New Yorkers file more than $1 million ex uh, tax returns for free, helping clients to claim refund-boosting tax credits and saving $150 million in preparation fees. As the committee knows, DCA has also filed a lawsuit against the for-profit school Berkeley College. DCA's lawsuit follows a nearly two-year investigation involving dozens of interviews with current, prospective, and former students, undercover operations, extensive research, and review of thousands of pages of documentation from Berkeley. Our complaint reveals that Berkeley engages in aggressive recruiting and debt collection tactics by luring consumers, many of whom are people of color and first-generation college students with low incomes, to one-on-one -on -one sales pitches, 
where they deceive them about potential financial obligations and say misrepresentations about other higher education in institutions. Among, among other things, our lawsuit alleges that Berkeley College misled students about financial aid, tricked students into taking out loans directly from Berkeley, deceived students about institutional grants, transfer credits, majors, and careers, and violated local debt collection laws by concealing its identity from former students when collecting debt, including debt that is not actually owed. That litigation is ongoing. BCA wants to do more than just hold companies accountable when their practices hurt students. We want to arm students with the information they need to protect themselves before harm occurs. BCA research and investigations, along with research and reporting by scholars, regulators, and others, suggest that some for-profit schools engage in patterns of deceit by misleading potential students about, among other things, the availability and impact of certain types of financial aid, transferability of credits, and the actual cost of attendance. That is why DCA recently proposed new rules to prohibit deceptive trade practices by certain for-profit schools and requiring new disclosures about program costs, graduation rates, job placement rates, completion times, and student debt amounts. With better information, prospective students can make informed decisions about what programs are right for them rather than taking on significant burdens based on misleading promises. We look forward to receiving comments from interested parties as these rules move through the administrative process. BCA also closed a major case against Enhanced Recovery Company, ERC, a licensed debt collection agency that sent illegal collection letters to tens of thousands of New Yorkers. Our settlement resolved DCA's findings that ERC failed to include information required by law on their collection letters, including the name of the agency and the name of a live contact. DCA settlement requires ERC to pay $105,000 civil penalty and to develop, implement, and monitor written policies to ensure compliance with both the settlement agreement and applicable DCA reg regulations, including training and compliance across all languages the agency uses to collect debt. DCA settlement with ERC resulted from a larger compliance initiative that examined the policies, procedures, and conduct of 40 licensed debt collection agencies with respect to New Yorkers with limit, limited English proficiency and their policies, procedures, and interactions with LEP consumers. We look forward to sharing the results and recommendations of that initiative in the coming weeks. In September, DCA announced the findings of a major OLPS enforcement initiative involving 42, involving 42 home care agencies throughout the five boroughs, affecting an estimated 50,000 workers. Home care aides are consistently a top complaint category for paid safe and sick leave violations. DCA used this data to proactively launch investigations into 42 home care agencies, employing close to 30% of home care aides in New York City, examining compliance with paid safe and sick leave, wage and hour requirements, and other workplace standards. The investigation began in July 2017 and focused on compliance with the paid safe and sick leave law and included interviews with more than 500 workers and an extensive review of documents provided by workers and employers. DCA also recently received a decision in a major case against Queens-based used car dealership Major World, one of the largest used car dealerships in New York City. DCA first filed the case in 2017 when we charged Major World with using deceptive and illegal practices to profit from vulnerable uh, low-income and immigrant consumers. The decision found that Major World committed tens of thousands of violations of the laws and rules that DCA enforces, including by falsifying consumer income and or, and or monthly rent obligations on credit applications, falsely advertising the financial terms of deals in print advertisement and on its English and Spanish websites, concealing the finance terms of deals from consumers, failing to provide legal documents in Spanish to certain Spanish-speaking consumers, and misleading consumers about their legal rights and the history, condition, and quality of the used cars they purchased. I am proud to um, inform the committee that the decision awarded DCA more than $3 million in fines, and importantly, puts Major World on notice that a continuation of its wrongful conduct could result in revocation of its license. 
The decision follows a 2018 settlement agreement with Major World that secured nearly $142,000 in restitution to 40 consumers directly and $68,000 to cover outstanding loans incurred as a result of Major World's actions. DCA looks back proudly on five decades of protecting, educating, and empowering consumers and businesses, but we also have our eyes on the path ahead. As I told the committee at last year's budget hearing, many of the core tools DCA relies upon to protect New Yorkers have remained unchanged since the time the agency was created. Over the last year, we've been working with the council to develop our proposals for updating these tools to better equip DCA to protect consumers and workers in a modern context. We hope that the council will act swiftly on our proposal and send it to Mayor de Blasio for his signature. The consumer protection law, the cornerstone of our work to protect consumers from unfair, deceptive, and unconscionable trade practices has not been updated since the agency's foundation in 1969, the year of the moon landing. The penalty amounts have not yet been adjusted for inflation during that time. That means that a business that engages in deceptive trade practices in 2019 is subject to the same penalties as a business that did so five decades ago, despite the fact that the consumer price index has increased more than 600% over the same period. If the consumer protection law is to be an effective deterrent, then penalties for businesses that deceive consumers must, at a minimum, keep pace with the cost of doing business and the prices paid by consumers. In addition, DCA's authority to seek restitution for consumers harmed by these practices must be clarified. DCA believes that this proposal is a common sense step to bring our consumer protection law into the 21st century and to ensure that the tools for protecting consumers keep pace with changing practices and markets. As we begin the next chapter of our history, DCA will be focused on raising public awareness of the work we do and how it benefits New Yorkers. To reach the one million New Yorkers who have student loans and the thousands more who may be considering higher education and to compete with a large investment in advertising and marketing by for-profit schools and debt relief programs, DCA plans to execute a highly visible and targeted public education campaign about student loan debt and for-profit schools this spring. The integrated multimedia campaign will educate aspiring college students about what to look for in a school and how to understand financing options, and it would help inform those who have loans about their rights and responsibilities, repayment options, and free financial counseling at the city's financial empowerment centers, along with other city resources. Advertisements will run on the city subway cars, bus shelters, telephone kiosks, uh, on radio and online, and in local businesses. In addition to outdoor advertising and online, we will use zip code and demographic information from DCA to hyper-target using placements in community media and on street furniture and street teams in neighborhoods known to have higher default and delinquency rates and or are located near predatory actors. Also this spring, DCA plans to launch an integrated multimedia public awareness campaign to ensure that the critical new protections that the city of New York has created for workers under Mayor de Blasio are fully realized. I am happy to report that DCA continues to provide New Yorkers with excellent service. According to the preliminary mayor's management report, DCA processed 71% of consumer complaints within 28 days days compared to 61% during the same four-month period last year. All complaints continue to be processed within 90 days. The median time to resolve a complaint improved by four days to 20 days, continuing the improvement from the fiscal 2017 average of 28 days. Our licensing division received 19,616 basic license applications in the first four months of fiscal 2019 and approved 13,349 in that time. These figures represent um, increases of 72% and 86% respectively. Even with a substantial increase in volume this year, the average wait time at the licensing centers remains stable at 10 minutes over the period, while the average processing time for basic applications fell 50%, dropping from four days on average to two. We also su successfully implemented the new license category for electronic cigarette dealers, processing 3,422 applications and issuing 2,929 licenses. 
In addition, DCA's enforcement division successfully refocused its tobacco inspection units to improve compliance with city and state tobacco laws regarding sales to minors. During the first four months of fiscal 2019, the number of tobacco inspections conducted with minors increased by 23%. From 2,264 to 2,781. The overall compliance rate with regards to sales to minors laws increased by five percentage points from 87% to 92%, while the compliance rate on follow-up inspections conducted after a sale to minor violation was issued increased by four percentage points from 83% in fiscal 2018 to 87% in fiscal 2019. So I would like to uh, thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today. The CA looks forward to deepening and strengthening partnership with the council as we embark over the next 50 years of protecting uh, and empowering consumers, workers, and businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for uh, the breakdown on, on the work you've done in the past and what you plan on doing in the future. And just stay on that topic about the future. Uh, you know, the mayor, as you mentioned, did announce that uh, DCA will be rebranded. Um, you know, we haven't seen any sign in the budget uh, that there is going to be the NIA change or any sort of restructuring within, within the agency in order to accommodate this new rebranding. Is, is there any plans on, um, you know, kind of looking at uh, the budget and, and how that's going to change in respect to the new roles of the agency? So we are still at the early stages of planning and we are aware that many of the mayor's uh, proposals uh, um, as listed in the state of the city address will require legislative action by the council. So we're hoping to work closely with you in the next few weeks and months to make that happen. Um, I can tell you that you probably will see uh, soon in a, a couple of public awareness campaigns that we're planning that the new name will be reflected there. So we'll use whatever existing funds we have right now to start uh, transitioning to the new name. So the 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 rebrand, the rebranding, I guess the, the restructuring of the agency will need legislative approval from the city council. We will it, need to get a chapter amendment. Is there any any uh, timeline with within uh, the mayor's side of, of when uh, you plan to uh, introduce or or show us any sort of legislative documents of what that will look like? Uh, specifically because he did mention this state of the city, so I'm guessing it should happen sometime within this year. Uh, yeah, we're hoping to move quickly on that, but as the commissioner mentioned, we're in the early stages. I'm sure that we'll be having some conversation with, with you and your colleagues about uh, the best way to get that done in the near future. Any uh, projection on uh, how many positions will DCA need to take on for these additional responsibilities in this rebranding of the, of the, com of the uh, agency? Not at this time. As always, we will see uh, what efficiencies we can create within the agency, and some of the work will be absorbed with the current staffing. So at this point, we don't have a, an estimate for a budget. But do you do you expect for there to be a growth within the agency because of this? Uh, depending, and as you know, we're working on paid personal time very closely with the council, and depending on what le legislation looks like, you know, we'll work closely with OMB to make sure that uh, we're properly uh, resourced through the work. Mm. Now, um, to, to, to kind of stay on the topic of, of um, uh, the agency staff, I mean, last year I think we, we, we've highlighted a mention that there was a vacancy rate of about 10%. Mm -hmm. um, this year it seems to be about 11.3% as of December 2018. Uh, is there a reason why that vacancy continues to exist? Or is there any, any plans of how uh, you plan on, on filling those roles? Mm -hmm. Well, we are currently working and we have, I think most of the vacancies are already posted, um, so we are going through the hiring process. Um, but I think um, there's definitely, we're working on a realignment with OMB. Uh, I understand that you had some questions about the, the UAs, the adjudication UA, so we're still working on that uh, with OMB, and in the next few weeks, I think you'll be able to see uh, proper realignment. The mayor's peg outlines roughly about 1.2 million in mandatory savings for DCA. Uh, how do you plan on achieving those those savings? So we were briefed on these uh, pegs just recently earlier this month, and we are just beginning the discussions with OMB to look at what areas or programs are uh, within the agency that could actually. Um, um, where we could find savings. So it's still very early, but we will work with them to achieve our target.
I have one question on the Office of Financial Empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, our numbers show that in 2018, uh, less than 40% of the clients served achieved measurable success in 2018. Can you unpack that a little bit? Uh, is there a reason why you believe why why it's below 40 percent? Is there a need by the agency to be able uh, to do more outreach or be able to provide mm -hmm. more assistance, or do you feel that you're doing everything you can do, but it's just something off when it comes to just the services and, and, and the folks trying to get there? Sure. Absolutely. The, um, the measurable outcomes that you referred to are actually particular to one of the programs at OFV. Right? We have several programs. We have the New York City Pre-Tax Prep Campaign. Uh, we have the FECs or the Financial Empowerment Centers, which is where the financial counseling happens, and these outcomes are for the financial um, counseling sessions, right? So for that particular program, the budget that is assigned for that is closer to $2.5 million, uh, and most of that money, close to $2 million, goes to actually to the providers, right? The ones who are uh, providing the financial coaching in the communities. So I would say that, um, you know, to be able to achieve a measurable outcome, um, individuals need to attend at least two financial coaching sessions and then achieve certain goals, whether are short-term or long-term goals. It could be anything from um, um, like obtaining a bank account, right, uh, from improving your credit score. Uh, so there are a number of things that they can do to achieve those uh, outcomes. Um, we are continuously looking at the program in a uh, ways in which we can um, retain clients and make sure that they come back for a second and a third session because that w that's what we need to show um, outcomes. Um, but I would say also that we are in the process of looking at how to make our financial coaching services more flexible, right? So sometimes a client may be able to come for the first time in person, but in, um, uh, until now we've required the sessions to be in person. We're looking at maybe remote coaching or something that will help people who are typically really busy and who don't have the time to just you know, make a trip to, to the center. So we're looking at always at efficiencies and we're hopeful, you know, we think of with the new program uh, changes, we'll see an increase in those numbers. Okay. Now th there, there was an incre a positive increase in the amount of clients you, you do serve by about eight, almost close to 800 uh, new clients between 2017 and 2018. What do you attribute that to? Well, we have, I believe, um, been providing um, additional hours, mm -hmm. um, but is that, let, let me just go back and check the number. I want to make sure that I'm giving you the right answer. Yeah, I, ha I have seven f 759 new clients uh, in the past year. Okay. I mean, I would just say it's part of our outreach efforts, right? We um, try to target our advertising in the bus shelters in those neighborhoods and communities where we know we are, we have a lot of low-income individuals who could use these services, and so our outreach has been much more targeted. Uh, to stay on performance, and I'll hand it over to my colleagues afterwards. Um, you know, over the years, uh, I would say DCA prided itself in being able to uh, issue less fines, but be able to collect uh, more more of those summonses. And and our our analysis shows that, um, or that that the there's been an increase of about up to ten percent of fines and summonses that have not been paid since 2017, is, is there a reason why there has been decline in the collection of those fines? Uh, are you referring to the sort of the, the fines that are not fully paid within 120 days? Uh, the timely payment of fines over 22% of summonses assessed in 2018 were not fully paid, up 10% from 2017. Yes, sir. Council member, I think there's- Yeah, within 120 days. Yeah, oh, right. okay. Yes, so, um, so as you're aware with the transition of our adjudicatory functions to oath, uh, we have less control over, you know, um, at what time the, the respondents or the businesses actually are, have completed with their um, administrative process, right? So to give you an example, right now, um, businesses or respondents have an opportunity to actually uh, move to vacate a finding by oath that they, you know, that they owe money to the agency or, in, or money in fines. And so uh, the, the time that takes for us to be able to start collecting is longer now. 
Do any of my colleagues have any questions? Peter Koop? Thank you, Commissioner Salasia. Uh, I want to touch a point uh, uh, I think uh, you mentioned before that consumer affairs which include uh, workers' protection. So uh, are you doing the same thing as the state labor department? So, no, it's, it's different work. Um, the laws that we enforce are the laws that the city, the council, and the mayor have worked to, to pass, right? Uh, so they're city workplace laws. Um, we, however, do serve as a resource for workers who have any type of questions. So if a worker calls us and they have not received paid for the sick days, right, but also have not been getting overtime pay, we will handle the paid sick leave investigation and we will work to connect them to their appropriate state agency or federal agency that handles those issues. So if a, a, a consumer go to the state de uh, labor department, would they not enforce the city laws? They, they don't, they, they, will, they, will take care, they won't take care of them? The State Department of Labor does not have the authority to enforce paid sick leave law. In fact, the only agency or body that can enforce that law is us. Uh, but agency. they can do the minimum wage law, right? Minimum wage, $15. The State Department of Labor and the Federal Department of Labor have different jurisdictions to enforce wage payment laws, yes. Okay, yeah. <coughs> so uh, the other questions I have is uh, since I represent the downtown flushing, right, which is really congested, and we, the sidewalks are uh, really important to the pedestrians. You know? So uh, I want to ask you, like, how does DCA grant and revoke stoop line license? Do you revoke stoop line license? Do we revoke them? Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, we, we can revoke um, licenses depending on what the license act, uh, rules or regulations give us power to do, but we cannot revoke them outright ourselves. We actually have to go to oath and file a case at oath, and then oath has to find that we are able to revoke a license. So uh, how, many, how many violations do you have to, uh, to get before you go to oath? Um, so typically any violation that we issue, if the business refuses to um, comply or to pay the fine, let's say, they can appeal. They can appeal that deci our decision, our fines, to oath. So it's really not in our control, right? So if the business decides to appeal, um, we need to go through in front of the administrative tribunal and try to prove our case. And ultimately, a judge from oath will decide whether we were right in issuing the, the violation or not. Um, is this? We, we issued or we conducted. So uh, oh. We, Councilmember, because you asked specifically about uh, taking mm -hmm. away licenses or revoking licenses, I can tell you that we um, we had at least 45 licenses suspended um, last year. 45 stoop line stand licenses suspended. Uh, we do a, about 1,900 inspections of stoop line stands, um, and we did issue uh, over 800 violations to stoop line stand licensees mm -hmm. uh, last year, including over 260 in, in your borough. So we do take the complaints very seriously. I know that I've been working with your staff um, on a couple of specific places uh, in Flushing on Main Street that have caused problems. Um, but I think it's important to remember that our stoop line stands are only licensed for particular types of products, uh, mostly food um, and flowers. So we, so some of the congestion that happens in, in, the, in those types of streets is related to um, is related to things like s sale of goods, which is more of a general vending um, area, and that is enforced typically by PD. And I think we've we've discussed that with your local precinct as well. So I think, in terms of overall congestion, we're, we're always looking to work with the other agencies, health licenses, food vendors. PD does a lot of the enforcement, sanitation, and enforces some of the uh, the street use rules as well. So I think it's really a, uh, a multi-agency effort. But in terms of specifically the stoop line stands that we license, we take complaints very seriously. There isn't um, an automatic revocation of licenses 
for example, if you get a certain number of violations, as the commissioner mentioned, we not only have to go to oath to have each individual violation sustained by an administrative law judge, we then also have to have that administrative law judge decide that we can revoke the license under the law. Um, and in the case of um, soup line stands, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's multiple violations within a, a two-year period in order for us to have the authority to seek revocation of that license. That said, there are the, it requires a landlord's consent to have a stoop line stand out in front of the store. And so we've had some success in cases where stores are causing big problems, um, talking to the landlord and informing them that of the violations that we've issued and sometimes consent will be withdrawn, which allows us to uh, take back the license. Well, that's the problem, because we are finger pointing uh, all the time. Uh, you, you just mentioned sometimes it's a sanitation department job, sometimes it's a NYPD job, so you free agents keep pointing fingers to each other. You know? That's why uh, we have these congestions on Main Street uh, for the last 10 years, nothing has been improved. So, look at this, you know, this, the, the, one of the biggest problem I've received is from pedestrians, you know, they cannot walk, you know, they, they hate these uh, conditions. This is like conditions in the 50s, or, you know, in, in third world countries, you know. People use all the sidewalk to sell stuff, you have to like, walk around them, and, uh, and I'll give this to you when, after the meeting, but we have to pay special attention. Mm -hmm. The reason I get, I so, I'm so adamant about this is because we are downtown Flushing. Mm -hmm. you know, our sidewalks are really important you know, because we have thousands of people walk on the sidewalks. We are the one of the, we are the second most business place in New York City. And we don't want these uh, like merchants to take advantage of the heavy traffic and put everything outside on the streets, on the sidewalk to sell. And, and consumer vans, uh, uh, the HPD, uh, no, not HPD, uh, the MIPD, they are pointing fingers to each other. Oh, this is not my job. This is a consumer affairs job. Uh, well, we, don't, we, don't, we don't know the license of fate or not, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, sanitation, they say, oh, this is a consumer affairs job. So that's why conditions like this persist for like more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. And one, in the, one of the most busy places in downtown Flushing, mm -hmm. you know, where the Long Island Railroad is, where the seven train is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we have 22 buses. You know, they have bus stops on Main Street. One of these places, like, look at this. Uh, this is the bus stop. This on this mm -hmm. on 41 row and Main Street. And we have so many like illegal vendors here. I mean, I pointed to this a long time ago. This is a stretch of walls. They are not stoop lines. They have no, no way to get a license. So again, Council- Yeah, it has been like this for 10 years. So again, Council Member, we, uh, our jurisdiction well, is- Well, more than 10 years, no. Um, our, we know this is an important issue for you and for your constituents, and we've been out, I've been out there with you um, to see those conditions. Uh, but there, it is true that there are a number of agencies implicated here, um, and we're always uh, on the lookout for stoop line stands specifically. I think in that, uh, in terms of the vendors on the street, we do know that a lot of that some of the vendors there are disabled veteran general vendors, so they are allowed to be in um, restricted areas. Um, the, now that said, I think that we are all, we're all, we always stand ready to work with NYPD to help them understand what the laws and rules are around general vendors, which is where we have, where we are the licensing entity. Um, and we've extended that hand uh, to them before. We'll cont continue to do so. Um, and we will always work with you on specific stoop line stand issue. So if, if there is a license that where they're exceeding the bounds, we want to know that. We've, we've gotten that information from you before. We'll send out an inspector and we'll issue those violations. So, so how many like, enforcement agencies you guys have? How many enforcement agents? Um, for, for enforcing the stoop lines. Oh, well, our inspectors are not, um, other than the tobacco unit, right? Uh, our inspectors are 
uh, patrolling and inspecting for different types of license requirements and, and laws. So in Queens, we have seven inspectors that cover Queens, um, and they do a number of things in addition to. So how are they assigned? No, they is campaign driven, or how are they? It, it's both complaint driven, but we also schedule patrol inspections. So uh, the inspectors have routes that they follow. Um, based on um, typically how many violations in the past certain businesses have, have received. Uh, so we tend to go to areas where we see uh, higher rates of violations. But we will take your, the complaints. We, I'll take the pictures from you today. You know that I, I have come out also to walk the, um, the street with you, and I, I know what you're saying. Um, I think that we need to sit down and take a closer look at the work that we've done in Flushing, and we should be able to provide you with more detailed information on the number of licenses that we've issued in, in Flushing and what has been suspended and revoked and continue to think about a, a solution. Yeah, I, I know this. You, you guys inspect the regular business a lot. No, every year you go once or twice uh, uh, to inspect their, their license and all the other stuff or even their high stickers or expired stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm disappointed you don't like, pay attention on, on the street vendors. Uh, that much. This is not a veterans. They are not veterans. They are, this is a regular supermarket or food stand. They extend their places, mm -hmm. especially after five o'clock. They think, oh, at five after five o'clock, there's no enforcement, mm -hmm. right? They put everything out on the street, on the sidewalk. So consumers and the pedestrians have no place to walk. They have to walk on the streets. Yeah. Well, I'm committing to the next inspection. We will do it after five o'clock. And if you tell us there's a particular like day of the week when you think it's worse, we'll come out and take a look. So, so and then on, uh, uh, on your agents, how many of these agents are multilingual? Do they speak any other language if they work in Queens? Uh, we do. We have uh, uh, language capacity. I don't know that I have the exact numbers of how many of our staff speak other languages, but they also have access to... Um, Language, language line. line right? Yeah, council members, so when our inspectors go out to a store, they have a, a card with multiple languages indicated on the card. Uh, and the and if the, the business owner, if they prefer their inspection to be conducted in a different language other than English, they can point to it and the inspector will connect with language line telephonic interpretation and conduct the inspection in that uh, in the preferred language. Uh, in addition, we do have uh, multilingual enforcement staff as well as staff in other units, and we can get you um, a breakdown of that. Okay. So one more thing I want to touch on the points the, the, on the laundry mats, right? The, in my area, there are a lot of la laundries, right? Laundry, mm -hmm. And they have been complaining to me about on the receipt, you, know, they, they, you have to show the uh, customer's address. But they said nobody wants to give the address uh, to them. Mm -hmm. So uh, when consumer affairs come to see their receipts, they, there's no address, they find them you know, for each one. Yeah. So, so. And then this is a very really old regulation, so we, we should change it. I mean, yeah. as long as they have a cell phone yeah. uh, listed on the receipts, that's yeah. good. this should yeah. be good enough. Yeah. Council member, we, we have heard that complaint as well. Um, and I think I've actually had a conversation with your staff. That requirement is, is in the law. Um, and I think that we would be amenable to having a discussion with you about how we, um, how we correct that fact and we, how we reconcile the law with sort of the practices that are in place now that are easy for businesses to implement but also still protective of consumers. But I would just also add that we have accepted um, receipts that say did not want to provide address, right? So if, if um, you know, the, the business still has to write something down, and make the effort to get the address, but they can say customer refused to provide the address. So they have the right down the law, customer the, uh, the law refused to, to provide the address. Refused to yeah. provide address. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it's too complicated. They have to write the sentence, you know, every receipt. You, know, understand. you have 100 customers, you have, you have to write down 100 times. So I think we, maybe we have to change the, uh, the law. Uh, uh, with the chairman here. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. And also on the same, same subject, uh, on the push cards they have on the, you know, the laundry, mm -hmm. where you had to put a sign there uh, with the address, is so uh, the address has to be one year, how was the regulation? 
that's yeah, in the law. I believe that's also in the law, but it sounds like there are a couple of things that we should follow up with you on um, to have a, a more detailed conversation about what your constituents are bringing anyway, to you. Anyway, the, the, yeah. the requirement is too big. You know, you, the, the, the count is only this big, and then you have the big, big sign, you know? It's, Ridiculous, no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Councilman, we can uh, we can set up a meeting with you to discuss specifically the issues that your your laundry con owner laundromat owner constituents have brought to you. We're happy to do that. Um, we know that there was a sort of a recent amendment to this, and that has brought attention to the the law. So we're happy to discuss that with you. I believe that's part of the laundry licensing law. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioner. Uh, it's good to see you here. Thank you, as always, for the work that uh, DCA is doing, which um, continues to be just like, uh, I feel like you guys are like uh, underappreciated heroes of uh, in New York City these days with the work that you're doing for student on student loan debt, on consumer protection, and through the Office of Labor and Policy Standards. Um, it's really remarkable what's going on. I think it's hard for people to appreciate because it's kind of so sprawling and your name still doesn't match really the, the work that you do. Um, so anyway, thank you for doing it. Um, and I really value the breadth of that work, but you know my, my favorite uh, is in the Office of Labor and Policy Standards. So I wanna ask a little about that. You know, because that is a newer unit, uh, it, it's harder to find in the mayor's management report and in the budget. So, um, and we actually spoke about this, maybe it was even at last year's hearing about developing a better way to really like see, understand the outcomes of, understand the resources for that work. Mm -hmm. um, but so far, I can't really find it either in the MMR or in the budget. So what, you know, what can you tell me about OLPS and the resource it's, it, it needs since we keep giving it more and more work to do, uh, and how it is being grown to to achieve its you know achieve its mm -hmm. mission, and where we're tracking its outcomes right. uh, yeah. in ways that we can then understand what we're getting for that money, which I know is a lot, um, but I think isn't yet showing up in the ways that would help us in the budget process. Yes, and thank you, thank you for all your support throughout the years. Uh, I know you're being a champion, as many of the council members here too. Um, so, um, can you find me the number of that? Mm -hmm. So, let me just tell you a couple of things. Uh, you are right that um, not all of the laws right now have metrics in the MMR report, right? Um, pay safe and sick leave law is there, but not the most recent laws. Um, so, I would say though that we try to include some of the progress on our enforcement in the narrative. We also, at this point, have, we published, I don't know, I think we published like five reports last year with um, like, like the State of Workers' Rights Report, a report just on freelancers, and you know, it, all numbers are there. Now, believe so, me, this is not so, a like, are you doing the work? Yeah. It's just how do we make that work yeah. visible in the budget yeah. process so that we can make sure you have the resources necessary to do it and we understand what those resources are, are paying for. I will definitely see if um, Nick has anything to add, but I would say to you right now, um, there are 45 positions uh, in OLPS, uh, 38 are active positions, and uh, all the, the remaining vac vacancies, seven of them are posted, right? Now, we're going through a realignment process. Yeah, so the seven vacancies are posted, um, and we do have some selected candidates for most of the seven. So only about two or three are remaining that are, have not have a selected count. So we do see that in the near future, it should be fully staffed. And what's the projected head count for the budget that we're mm. reviewing? Is yeah, it so that same 45? 45? Right now it's steady at 45. I was just explaining earlier that we recognize that uh, many of the mayor's proposals in the state of the city address will require some legislative action, uh, but we're still working on that. So it really depends on what paid personnel time ends up looking like, right? Then we'll have to figure out what resources are needed for that, and we'll, we'll work closely with OMB to make sure we have. And, and this is why I'll just get a little more transparent. Like, we're going through a peg analysis on the one, you know, we need to be doing that, but I don't want it to happen that resources are cut here when yeah. we know there's gonna be big new need for paid personal time, mm -hmm. but also I wanna make sure there's enough, you know, personnel to enforce the Freelancers and Free Act and our Fair Work Week uh, you know, laws for fast food and retail workers. Um, 
so I guess you know what I, I to, on those two things in particular on on Fair Work Week and freelancers and free uh, are there do you have now that you can give me or can you follow up to give me some more recent uh, data on tracking outcomes yeah. enforcement I know you did a report at the end of the first year freelancers right. and free but I assume there have been a lot more yeah. you know kind of action since then um, yeah. you know that's partly to feel good about the work that's getting done and partly to be able for us to make the case internally that this is one thing we want to make sure we're, we're at least preserving and preferably growing resources for but not letting be subject to, to cuts. Uh, let me just say that the freelancers, Eastern Free Act has been a huge success and really um, we've served over 788 compl uh, freelancers who had actual complaints for owed wages uh, we're like nearing a million dollars in restitution, so that's a lot of money in the pockets of people who wouldn't have had it without these resources. So it's yeah. been really fantastic. We have people from like we have um, um, news uh, outlets from Italy, England calling us to talk about this work. I mean, it's a credit to your your work and your efforts to get this in the books, but it's been really fantastic, and we do have. Uh, it's, it's sort of the kind of work that uh, is not as resource intensive, but you really have a lot of uh, a great return for the work. Right. So. Well, and we would, I'd love if we could do more outreach because I think we know that the set of people who are most likely to know about the freelancers and free act are freelancers who might have more access to information, be more white collar professional freelancers. We've got all these independent workers who might, uh, we know, be having their wages stolen. So, we, you know, if, if we had more resources, we could do more outreach, we could provide more restitution. Uh, absolutely, and the administration has given us a, a one-time uh, like allocation of funding, so very soon, in the next maybe month or even less than that, you're going to see uh, uh, our campaign on, on, you know, how workers can come reach us, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fantastic, but we are being very um, strategic about targeting the areas, neighborhoods where we know we need to see more freelancers come forward. And, and Council Member, we al also have, as the, com the Commissioner mentioned, the State of Workers' Rights Report, which actually breaks down the outcomes by law. So you'll be able to see um, what the outcomes were for Fair Work Week, for example, and for freelancers. And I think that that would really help you to understand. And when uh, was the, I might have missed the most recent report. When did that come uh, it out? It came out recently. Uh, I don't have an exact date, but we're happy to provide it the for you. The last couple of months. All right. Well, I can get it. I mean, I'll take one, but you know, I, I can get it online. So that is fine. Let me just suggest again, which I think, so that's great. I will take a look at mm -hmm. that. I will use that internally to make sure we're keeping resources strong here for the future. And let me just suggest again that you do what's necessary to integrate those outcomes, since you're tracking them anyway, into yeah. the MMR and the, and the budget work so we can keep track uh, going I forward. would just say that we, certainly we had started the discussions with um, Mayor's Office of Operations, um, and as you are aware, we had a couple of lawsuits challenging our authority in the last year, so we didn't know where we would land, so we're going to uh, restart those conversations. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Council, Council Member Chin. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Hi. And thank you for all the great work that your agency does. Um, I wanted to follow up with some of the issue in terms of education, um, you know, for the general public, but also for small businesses who go to Department of Consumer Affairs um, to get licenses. How many um, staff do you allocate to really focus uh, on doing education and outreach? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have a couple of uh, different answers for that. We have an outreach team uh, within the Department of Consumer Affairs, right? If you wanna focus on uh, business education, I can give you the the numbers for that, but uh, for our outreach team, we have close to we have about five, five people, five people um, who speak different languages, who do outreach for both consumers, workers, and businesses. We have also a team of uh, visiting inspector program um, inspectors, and they are just dedicated to going uh, and meeting with business owners that are um, obtaining licenses from DCA. Uh, so that's the, I think I spoke about this last year, it's a new program 
uh, where the moment that you apply for a license for the first time and you get a license from us, you get your license and also uh, a call to, to you know, basically what, for us to come in into your business and uh, so that the first thing that you see from us is not just that we're coming in to enforce, but we're coming in to really just educate you on all of the laws that we enforce. And um, we spend a lot of time in these visits. We make sure that we answer all the questions. There are no fines, there's nothing. And the goal is really to get people started on the right foot with the right tools. How many so of those? There's incidents? three inspectors in that, uh, in that group. Uh, now, there are our most seasoned, um, most experienced inspectors, so they're really good at, at their jobs. They also speak different languages. Um, but I would say that we, um, beyond the, that work, right, we um, do a lot of work with uh, council members and we coordinate business education days. Um, so that's an effort where we actually bring an entire team of people and they're not just the outreach people, but they're just inspectors and people from other programs. And we've done, I believe we did last year 14. We did 14, yes. 14 business education days and we pick uh, commercial corridors uh, after talking to council members who advise us as to where the need is. Uh, and all we do, again, we visit anywhere from 70 to 100 businesses or more, and we just go door to door bringing information for business owners. Again, those days, there are no fines issued, it's just all education. Uh, we also have started doing business roundtables, uh, where it's a more like intimate group of people, uh, and I'm happy, I will be happy to work with you. Uh, I go to those roundtables because I want business owners to see us as approachables and uh, as willing partners in helping them to um, be in compliance with the laws. So I'm happy to, to coordinate something with your office. Yeah. It just doesn't seem like you have enough staff support because like, even like for a business applying for license three for the whole city, uh, it's a lot of area to cover. And then like outreach, you only have five um, because the work that you do is so critical. Um, because especially in the immigrant community where there's a lot of new businesses, they need a lot of help. Um, and relating to what Council Member Ku was talking about is that some of it is, has to be regular, I wouldn't say enforcement, but just like regular checkup and regular so that people don't feel like, oh, they can get away with things. Mm -hmm. And with the stoop line, I have the same problem mm -hmm. um, in my district um, in Chinatown. And I think that is it possible when someone comes and apply for a stoop line stand, they can only extend out, what, three feet, right? It's, yeah. like, it's actually slightly larger than that. So three feet is the, the, what you're referring to, I think, is the three foot rule, which is uh, where business owners can put goods out in front of their store without a license from DCA. The uh, stoop line, a business has to come to DCA if they want to extend further than that. So typically it will be four feet, but in um, specified cases under the law, it's uh, five feet. So how do you, you judge that based on the width of the sidewalk, I assume? Yeah, that's part of the equation, yeah. So is there a way that the DCA, um, see, it, there's gotta be a way for people, if they put it out for three feet, they have to get some permission or license from DCA because they never, if they don't get a license, mm -hmm. they never put out three feet. What, what I'm looking at is that if there's a way that DCA can actually paint the line, you know, saying that this is what's allowable if you are applying for a soup line stand mm -hmm. or if you are doing, extending your businesses, because what's happening is a lot of the, the owner of the business itself, they rent out that space mm -hmm. and they charge a lot of money um, mm -hmm. to whoever rents it. And that's been going on for years and years. But there is no guideline. What I'm looking at is if DCA can come out and just put down the green tape, like you can't go beyond this line, and that would help enforcement for NYPD and everything. Because right now, every time that enforcement come, it's just like a big to-do. When you have sanitation come and they take everything and they throw it into the garbage truck, and it just creates havoc and people in the community are not upset. No, they're upset. Like, why is the city doing this? But meanwhile, on a daily basis, if there's a way to let people know, this is how far you can go. And if you go beyond that, you're violating the law. So, and so if a police officer come by or 
DCA inspector come by, they know that, hey, mm -hmm. this is a violation. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's a couple of things there. The, the first is the, the three-foot rule is not something that we're the primary enforcer for. It's actually um, sanitation, typically. Um, so if you have, if you're going further than that, they can issue you a violation for the three-foot rule, same as, as if they were issuing you a violation for, the, um, for an A-frame sign. Um, obviously, I can't speak for them, but I'm just speaking from experience. When we've gone out on these walks with, for example, your office or Council Member Cruz's office, um, the VIP program that the, the commissioner was mentioning, if someone applies for a steel point stand license, they get it, a senior inspector comes out, they will look at that stand um, and they will tell that business, you're too far out. And the next time I come back here, if it's still this far out, I will have to issue you a violation. And that will help that business um, come into compliance. But our, our stoop line stand um, license only comes into play when someone is, is trying to get that extra um, space. The, otherwise, it, um, it, be, it involves other agencies. And I think that's part of the challenge that you and Council Member Ku are identifying. Uh, and so the, to the extent that our authority is involved here, we're, um, we're happy to meet with you, look at problems in your community, and think about creative ways that we, can, that we can start solving it. But I think the VIP program does start that process because if someone gets a DCA license and they decide I'm going to put out a six-foot stand, when our inspector comes, they will know that. Um, and not only will the business be informed that they have to make a change, um, the in, our enforcement division will be aware that that problem was identified. Yeah, I think what uh, Council Member Ku and I, maybe with the chair, we should really look at changes in legislation. Um, I mean, this is so antiquated with so many different departments. You know, uh, it just doesn't make sense. And our sidewalks are so crowded, and especially like in Low Manhattan, the sidewalks are so narrow. Like, you just don't have the space. But people are taking advantage. Um, and they're renting out those space for a lot of money. And then they don't follow the rule. And, and that specifically, council member, where a business rents out the space in front of their store to someone else to uh, operate a stand, that is prohibited by uh, the law already. So if, that, if you are aware that that's happening, I, I would encourage you to come and, and report that to us so that we can go and take a look at that. The stores are not allowed to you know, rent a storefront and then um, charge their neighbor rent to put a stand in front of that store. Yeah, I mean, if you have a store yeah. that sells hardware and stuff, and then in front of it sells fruits and vegetables. Right. <laughs> so we want to know about those, um, and, and we want to work with you. I want to go back, though, really quickly up to, to outreach, because we do have, as the commissioner mentioned, that dedicated outreach unit of five people, but also other divisions have staff that engage in outreach. So a good example of this is the Office of Labor Policy and Standards that last year conducted 430 outreach events on its own, um, in addition to the general outreach that we do. And overall, we held um, 913 events um, at the last year, and those include things like tabling, presentations to the community, days of action, um, and you'll see in the, also in the PMMR, I believe our number is currently, or for last fiscal year was over 18,000, which is a high in, um, in recent years and actually an improvement of about 5,000 over the previous fiscal year. So we're very proud of the outreach work that we're able to do with the staff we have, and it's not just in that outreach team. They partner with outreach staff and other divisions as well. Yeah, and I, I do want to continue to see more outreach and education in terms of all the you know, the laws that we have passed, we're basically, Absolutely. and making sure that workers are, are taking, you know, taking these benefits and not being harassed by employer. And if they are, that they know that they can come to the department and file complaints and things like that. So I think those kind of education work needs to really continue. Yeah. And we welcome your ideas, suggestions for where else we should be going, especially in your district. Let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Um, with that said, uh, I'd like to call up the next panel. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Up next, we have Nadia Marin Molina from the National Day Labor Organizi Organizing Network, uh, Christian Zelaratnian, Luis Cores Cortez, Alexis Paz.
Okay, you may have a seat and you begin. Anyone can begin. Just state your name for the record. Nadia Marin Molina from the National Day Labor Organizing Network. Start. Um, so thank you for giving us the opportunity to give testimony today on behalf of the New York City Day Labor Workforce Initiative. Um, we'd like to provide some background information on day laborers in New York, a national perspective on the current context, and an overview of the Day Labor Workforce Initiative. Um, day laborers first, we're talking about workers who are hired by the day um, with no guarantee of future work. They're providing an essential service in the US labor market in general, generally working in construction, landscaping, domestic work, um, and home improvement, and have also taken a, an important role in disaster relief. Um, meanwhile, day laborers are also vulnerable to workplace injuries, uh, wage theft, and uh, difficult working conditions and face all these challenges in a national context where their rights as immigrants and workers are under constant attack. As you know, um, all workers at this point are uh, deportation priorities. Um, if they're undocumented for the federal government and uh, programs like DACA and TPS have been terminated, are, are, being, are in the process of being terminated. Why are the conditions of day laborers important for um, workers here in New York City and why are they important to New York City? because when unscrupulous contractors see that day laborers are exploited and there isn't a response, then they will continue to do this and they continue, to, they graduate and move on to more and more workers and continue to take the same action. And when one worker comes to the United States and finds that his first job here is a job where his rights are not respected and where he's working in really difficult uh, working conditions, every job he goes to after that he's going to expect will be more or less the same. On the other hand, the day labor centers, which are going to testify today, um, are an important and effective form of grassroots uh, workers' rights enforcement. Um, employers know that a worker is not alone, and just this um, has reduced the incidence of wage theft, which usually out on a street corner, we've documented it about 50% of workers um, find that, uh, that have been a victim of wage theft in the past two years at a day labor center like the ones that the city has been supporting, um, that is reduced to a very minimal amount. The day labor centers, um, there are six day labor centers in five boroughs, and they provide job referral, wage theft legal clinics, know your rights trainings, referrals to critical services, and workforce development. And the day labor workforce initiative has uh, demonstrated incredible success. There are now six day labor centers in New York City, and there were only three when the initiative began. And now they're dispatching more jobs than they ever have. Close to 1,800 jobs were dispatched just in the last fiscal year. Um, they're providing skills trainings in painting, sheetrock, carpentry, et cetera. Um, and they've held a lot of workshops and done education and collaboration. Uh, with OOPS, who's you know giving testimony today, um, with the Department of Small Business Services, working closely with the Human Rights Commission, the district attorney's offices in the various boroughs, um, and state agencies as well, as a way to make sure that workers are, are getting their rights enforced. Um, there's still much more to do. In the coming years, the day labor uh, in the coming year, the day labor workforce initiative is going to focus on its role in emergency response and disaster preparedness, um, because day laborers always end up being uh, called upon in, for example, after Hurricane Sandy. Um, it happened here in New York. And in building the leadership of women day laborers who are looking for good jobs, um, just like men out in the corners in construction, but in construction and also in house cleaning um, as well. Nationwide, um, other, other centers and other areas are looking at New York um, as a model and a beacon um, of hope and of, uh, of what can be done. And so we're, we're here to thank you um, for the support so far and also to ask that you commit to continuing 
um, the expansion and development of the day labor centers, continuing the day labor workforce initiative um, with funding in, in the budget this year. The funding proposal is for $3.6 million in fiscal year 2020. Thank you um, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Christian. I am from La Colmena. I'm going to read a testimony on behalf of uh, my executive director. He prepared this, but he's out of the country at the moment. So thank you for the opportunity to give this testimony on behalf of La Colmena in support of the New York City Day Labor Workforce Initiative for fiscal year 20. La Colmena is a community-based organization and worker center based on Staten Island with the mission to empower the immigrant community through education, culture, and economic development. In Staten Island and, and every other uh, work center, wage theft and workplace accidents continue to happen disproportionately to day labor uh, workforce on Staten Island. They face unique challenges, particularly after the last presidential election where we have seen an uptick in report of harassment and discrimination adding to the already precarious nature of the industry. Thanks to the day labor workforce initiative, we have been able to open a safe space for day laborers where they can access dignified jobs, critical training, and occupational health and safety, know your rights, and referrals to legal and other critical services. They also have a space to protect themselves from unscrupulous employers and access to basic needs such as restrooms and protection from the elements in extreme heat in the summer and harsh winters because workforce uh, of day laborers, uh, primarily um, they share the space of corners, uh, waiting for jobs throughout the day. They also have a space to discuss their issues and articulate uh, collective solutions based on the values of solidarity and economic democracy. We ask that New York City continue to be a bold leader in protecting one of the most vulnerable workers in our city and commit to support the continued expansion and development of day labor centers by continuing the, la the day labor work workforce initiative with funding of $3.6 million in fiscal year 2020. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. We look forward to working together with you to improve the lives of day laborers and all workers in New York City. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alexis Pass, and I'm here on behalf of New Immigrant Community Empowerment. I'm here in support of the Day Labor Worker Force Initiative. I hope that by sharing my story as an employee at NICE, working directly with some of the most vulnerable workers in our city, you get a sense of the work that we do and the need to continue supporting and protecting the day laborers in New York. For me, especially, working at NICE is more than just a job. The problems our members face are the same ones that my family faced when we first came here. Uh, I belong to the Purepecha community, uh, an indigenous group from South Central Mexico, and as any other indigenous group in Mexico, we face a lot of discrimination and uh, economic hardship. Uh, so like many of our members, my family had to come to the US because we didn't have any opportunities in Mexico. There are no jobs in the countryside. So unfortunately here, we found ourselves facing some of the same discrimination and abuse that we experienced back in our country. Uh, at NICE, we receive people from all over Latin America. When our members first come to, the, to our center, they come with complaints about employment agencies, notarios, lawyers, uh, employers who are, not, who are not paying them. So, and everything, all of this happens because of the lack of information when they first come in, uh, and, and also because they don't know their rights. So, also, th these newly arrived immigrants have a high need to find work and oftentimes they end up taking jobs where wages and health and safety conditions are bad. Uh, also, many of, many of them, just like my family, they come from places where they survive with five, seven dollars a day. So a lot of times they don't even understand or they don't even know that they're being exploited. Uh, and even if they understand that their rights have been violated, uh, they think that there is nothing they can do uh, and that this is the price that they have to pay for being immigrants. Uh, and it's also because back home, uh, government institutions, they're, they're not there for us. So a lot of times they think that nothing can be done. Uh, through my time at NICE, uh, I've seen an increase of wage theft cases every month. Uh, when I started working there, I saw between 15 to 20 cases every month. And now we're seeing close to 
40, 45 cases every month. In the past year, we uh, conducted intakes for more than 300 different cases of wage theft, and our members have reported an amount of more than $600,000 that, that is owed to them. Uh, so at NICE, we engage in this wage theft process from like, uh, we make negotiation calls with the employer. We try to ask them, why are you not paying our workers or our members? Uh, so oftentimes we, we're able to collect that money there, but uh, in many other situations, it's really complicated to recover these wages. So uh, we also screen our members for uh, discrimination, workers' compensation, and the health and safety, safety cases. Uh, but the sad reality is that although these workers are taking a step forward to report the cases, uh, it takes too long to recover the wages through the city or uh, state agencies. So, and that's even if they recover the wage because uh, for most of the cases that I've seen, uh, a lot of them, they're still pending cases. They're with the Department of Labor. They're uh, in case they're a sick leave complaint. They're at the Department of Consumer Affairs. And uh, it just takes so many years to recover the wage. So a lot of times that doesn't really encourage our members to file a report. But uh, we really try to emphasize to them when they come in why this is a problem. Uh, so through that, we have established really strong uh, relationships with our members. So when they come in, uh, so they're the ones that are encouraging other coworkers to report these bad actors because they know that this is a systematic problem. Even if it takes years to recover these wages, it, it's also a way to find these bad actors. And, and, and it's a way for us to tell our members, oh, be careful with this employer. So we try to let them know that when they report the case, they're not only trying to recover their wages, but they're also protecting other coworkers from suffering or being a victim of wage theft. Uh, so in addition to continued services, we also need systematic solutions. We need to put a stop to bad actor employers who keep abusing our members. While these actors continue to operate without any consequences, uh, our members struggle to keep up with rent or other basic needs. Uh, we need to make sure that these bad actors are aware that what they're doing has consequences. This can be done by suspending or revoking the construction licenses of these bad actors so that they can continue operating as usual. I encourage the city council to call construction contractors accountable by revoking or suspending their licenses for failing to pay wages and keeping unsafe work conditions. Uh, I thank you for making this work possible and ask that the city council continues to support this critical work to empower the day labor community and my community. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, committee members. My name is Luis Cortez. I'm the Worker Center Director of the Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights. Um, uh, an organization that for over 35 years has been providing high quality, trustworthy uh, immigration related legal services to the immigrant community. NMCIR is a nonprofit organization founded in 1982 to educate, defend, and protect the rights of immigrants through direct services, civil engagement, community organizing, and advocacy. The Worker Center grew out of our community services, and we are created a new space for workers looking for better job opportunities and a safe and uh, trustworthy place to receive a variety of trainings. We are part of the coalition that makes up the Day Labor Workforce Initiative. The initiative partners include War Workers Justice Project uh, in Brooklyn, New Immigration Communi uh, Immigrant Community Empower uh, Empowerment in Queens, Staten Island, Community Job Center and Catholic Charities of uh, Archdiocese of New York in the Bronx, each of whom have a long history of engage, um, engaging, engaging uh, immigrant communities and working with day laborers in all five boroughs. We are thankful for the support 
that city council provided the initiative in fiscal year 19 and urged the council to invest 3.6 million in the day labor workforce initiative for the next fiscal year. The day labor uh, uh, workforce development initiative came together to address the needs of this underserved population, services that are even more essential now than ever before. As members of the city's informal workforce, day laborers experience rampant wage theft, pervasive con uh, const uh, construction accidents, workforce hazards, lack of access to workforce development training, and lack of uh, infrastructure. The initiative goal is to address these issues by linking day laborers to uh, vital services, providing trainings on workforce safety and legal rights, addressing wage theft, providing access to jobs, and most importantly, creating safe and dignified spaces for day laborers to congregate as they search for grainful work. New York City has the potential to lead the nation in the fight for, the, uh, for day labor rights. I'm here to speak on behalf of more than 2,000 workers who have reached out to us in the last year looking for work, asking about our ongoing OSHA training workshops and calling to report wage theft. Many immigrant workers have a lot of work experience in their countries of origin, but because of various, bar um, various barriers, including language, maybe working in different field or struggling to find work. I would like to draw your attention to this quote from the New York City Department of uh, uh, Small Businesses uh, Services about immigrant communities. Foreign born New Yorkers face unique challenges in connecting to living wage employment and are often overemployed but uh, or near the dreadful of, uh, for poverty in New York City. This is the reality of thousands today. They want to work, they want to learn new skills, they want to be trained. What we do at uh, Northern Manhattan Coalition providing is a worker center opening its door, offering respect, dignity, community, and a real possibility of bringing money home to pay rent and put food on the table. This is also an anti-poverty measure that brings economic health to individuals and to neighborhoods. This is why we are providing a space for organizing and providing opportunities for workers to build power together. The space also removes workers from the paradas and they are not affected uh, by adverse weather and abuses in the streets. With our job dispatching process, our goal is to increase wages, hold employers accountable, reduce likelihood of employer abuse uh, uh, and increase safety. Through an engage, uh, enhancement uh, to three point six million in the fiscal year 20, a total of six day labor centers will operate in New, York's, uh, in New York City by the end of the fiscal year uh, f uh, 20. We will engage our services to pr uh, provide more construction safety and skill trainings, immigrations and know your rights workshops, and referrals to or other organizations, free legal services. The initiative will also train and uh, equip day laborers to safety and strategically respond when um, a natural disaster strike the city by aiding the city and its residents in a cleanup and reconstruction. We are uh, poised to take major steps in addressing the needs to the day labor uh, in fiscal year 20, and we need the continued support uh, of the city council to make these plans a reality. We thank the city council for this opportunity to testify. We hope that you will consider our budget priori priorities and recommendations during this year's budget negotiation process. And look forward to continue working closely with you to ensure that hardworking individuals and families have opportunities to achieve economic advancement and create shared prosperity for all New Yorkers. Buenos días, honorable Rafael Espinal y distinguidos miembros del Comité de Asuntos al Consumidor de la Ciudad de Nueva York. Mi nombre es Margarita Arana. Soy madre de una pequeña y hermosa bebé de un año que se llama Zoe. Soy trabajadora de construcción y miembro del Proyecto de Justicia Laboral. Primero, 
agradecer la oportunidad de que este día pueda testificar. Um, the, the testimony is in, is in English and Spanish. If you, is it okay to just do it in Spanish or do you want me to translate into English? In Spanish is okay, okay. Quiero compartirles que mi experiencia en este país no ha sido fácil, pues cuando uno llega tiene la idea de que por estar en un país donde no es tu tierra, no tenemos derecho y tenemos que aguantar lo que venga. Así sea un maltrato, que nos, humill que nos humillen, que tengamos que aceptar las malas condiciones de los trabajos, los salarios injustos y personas que se aprovechan haciendo odio raci racial por ser inmigrante. He realizado diferentes tipos de trabajo, removiendo nieve, limpiando casas, trabajé para una panadería y finalmente tuve que entrar al mundo de la construcción para poder suplir mis necesidades económicas. Pasé por condiciones muy malas de trabajo. A veces yo decía, no es justo, ¿por qué tengo que trabajar con estos peligros? En ocasiones mi jefe no me brindaba el equipo de protección personal necesario para realizar trabajos que afectaban mi salud. Y si yo reclamaba, él argumentaba que no había y que si no me gustaba, me buscara otro trabajo. Y fue de esa manera cuando empecé a buscar soluciones, buscando información de algún lugar que pudiera respaldar y asesorarme sobre mis derechos, si era que existían. Me comentaron que tenía que sacar mi OSHA 30. Fue así cuando en mi búsqueda a respuestas para sacar dicha licencia, Encontré el proyecto de justicia laboral, me inscribí y pude tomar el OSHA 30 de manera gratuita, lo que me pareció grandioso, pues en otros lugares la licencia tenía un costo muy alto y en mis condiciones no podía cubrirlo. Me di cuenta de que el proyecto de justicia laboral era el lugar donde yo me podía informar sobre mis derechos y tenía una respuesta para las preguntas que me hice hace tiempo desde que llegué a este país. Poco a poco me fui incorporando a las actividades de la que es hoy en día mi organización. Hoy estoy aquí para pedir que en este nuevo año fiscal se invierta 3.6 millones en los centros jornaleros y que sigan apoyando a nuestro centro, Proyecto de Justicia Laboral, y que nos permitan poder seguir contribuyendo a esta ciudad con nuestro trabajo y nuestros valores. En esta era de odio, racismo y sobre todo miedo, depende, dependemos de nuestro centro. Mi centro es mi segundo hogar. Es aquí que encuentro el respaldo que necesito para sacar a mi familia adelante y aprender a cómo defender mis derechos laborales y exigir respeto. En el centro he podido aprender nuevas habilidades con mi desarrollo personal conocer a cómo negociar salarios justos, como 20 la hora, hacer que me respeten y saber que no importa mi estatus migratorio para poder tener respeto hacia mi persona y defender mis derechos como ser humano. En el centro he encontrado una familia porque convivimos y luchamos juntos por los mismos objetivos, que es tener una vida mejor. También en mi centro usamos nuestras voces y poder colectivo para combatir el robo de salario. Se imparten talleres acerca de cómo prevenir el robo de salario, mejorar las condiciones de salud y seguridad en el lugar de trabajo y entrenamientos de construcción, por lo que se ha creado un comité de destrezas en el cual estoy involucrada. Hoy... Más que nunca, dependemos de nuestro centro para poder defendernos del sentimiento anti-inmigrante, actos racistas que existen en este país, la amenaza de deportaciones y redadas ha generado miedo y temor en nuestra comunidad, lo cual malos empleadores toman ventaja para no pagar los salarios, amenazar con llamar a la migra si nos organizamos y reclamamos nuestros derechos. Muchos trabajadores dependen de nuestro centro para tener un trabajo más digno, conocer sus derechos y hacer que los negocios cumplan con las leyes laborales y empleadores respeten los derechos de los trabajadores. También vemos la oportunidad de colaborar con su comité y agencia de asunto al consumidor para hacer que negocios y contratistas cumplan con leyes laborales y aquellos que no cumplen, renovarles sus licencias. 
puesto que ningún negocio debería operar en esta ciudad si está violando los derechos de los trabajadores y robándole los salarios a los trabajadores. También le pido apoyo para que podamos seguir dando la clase de 8 a 30 gratis en español en nuestro centro. En los últimos siete meses hemos entrenado 811 trabajadores y tenemos una lista de espera de 400 trabajadores que no podemos entrenar porque ya no tenemos esos recursos. Estoy aquí para pedir su apoyo para que se inviertan esos 3 millones.6 para que los centros como el proyecto de justicia laboral puedan seguir existiendo, respaldando a mi comunidad. Esperamos que ustedes consideren los centros de jornaleros como parte de sus prioridades durante el proceso de negociación presupuestaria de este año y esperamos seguir trabajando estrechamente con ustedes. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Um, are, are you going to translate that? In Do you mind giving us like a two-minute summary just for the interest of time? Thank you. Um, you have the full translation um, yeah, in we English do. at the end. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to just take some of the more important points. My name is Margarita Arana. I'm a mother of a beautiful one-year-old baby named Zoe. I'm a construction worker and a member of Worker Justice Project. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I want to share with you my experience in this country. I thought I had to accept the bad conditions on the job, unjust salaries, and let people take advantage of me. I've done different kinds of jobs, removing snow, cleaning houses, working in a bakery, and I entered the construction industry to be able to make ends meet. Sometimes my boss would not pro provide me with personal protective equipment for unsafe jobs, but I argued for better conditions. I began to look for information or a place that could advise on my rights, and that's when I found out about the Workers' Justice Project. Um, At the Workers' Justice Project, I got answers to many questions that I had asked myself since I arrived in this country. I'm here to request your support um, to invest $3.6 million dollars on the day labor centers and to support immigrant workers and day laborers. It's my second home. It is here that I found the support I need to take care of my family and learn to defend my labor rights. I was able to learn new skills, know how to negotiate fair wages, like $20 an hour and know that my immigration status does not matter when it comes to reclaiming respect and rights as human beings. Um, we've had workshops on preventing wage theft, improving health and safety conditions, and construction. We need our centers more than ever. And we see the opportunity to collaborate with your committee and the Consumer Affairs Agency to make contractors comply. Those businesses that do not comply with labor laws should not be allowed to operate in the city. Business licenses should be revoked if a business is violating workers' rights or stealing wages from workers. I request your support so we can continue to provide free OSHA 30 trainings in Spanish. In the last seven months, we've trained 811 workers and we have a waiting list of 400 workers that are waiting for a class, but we don't have resources. Um, we hope you will continue to consider the day labor centers and support during this budget negotiation season. Thank you. Margaret, any questions? And thank you so much for testifying, because I remember um, the start of fighting for uh, the day labor center, and to really see the success uh, that's happening gratifying. is really gratifying. And I think the city council, we will continue our support, because you're doing such great work. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to hear about all the great work that the centers are doing. Um, I guess my, 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 just my one question is, what, what was the funding the previous year? 1.9. So you're asking an increase of 3.6 to, to expand your work around the five boroughs. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you for enlightening me and, and showing me all the great work you do. This is, it's good to hear how the program is working, and I appreciate all you being here testifying. Thank you. All right, with that said, uh, this meeting, budget meeting hearing has been adjourned and we uh, expect to be back in May or June for the executive <laughs> uh, in May. Uh, so uh, we'll be back then to, to, to see uh, any uh, of the updates from the agency. With that said, this meeting is adjourned. Ha, ha, ha.